Resurrection is the correct word, not rapture. Resurrection is when mortality puts on immortality, corruption, and corruptibility. Amen? Talking about a full face and body lift. Awesome, right? Y'all say that's awesome. 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 It is awesome. And we'll meet those in the air. We're going to meet those who have fallen asleep in Christ in the air. Amen? So Paul writes, don't worry about those like those who have no hope. You have hope. For those that are asleep in Christ will rise up first and meet Jesus in the clouds, in the air. And then we who are alive will rise up with him, who are awake. And I want you to know, if you miss somebody, if someone has, has passed away that you, that you miss, they're more in your future than in your past. They are more in your future than in your past. You haven't begun to know your family until you see them in a resurrected state, immortal and incorruptible. And when you see them, the first time you'll see them is in the clouds with Jesus. That's the first time you'll see them. They'll be dressed in white, and they won't need glasses, and they'll have a full, if it's a bald man, you'll have hair like Fabio, like, like him. Locky and curly. That's my kind of hair right there. Okay, so... You understand what I'm saying? No receding hairline, no glasses. Hey, Daniel. Hey, Justin. Hey. hey. Amen. Yeah. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 amen, amen. Okay. So, when was the first resurrection? Jesus. He's the first fruits of the resurrection. Y'all say Jesus. Jesus. My, Lord My Lord is the first fruits of the resurrection. And right after he was resurrected, right after. The scripture says that over 500 holy men were seen throughout Israel. What does that say? What does that, what I just say? 500 what? Holy men were seen throughout Israel. So 500 were resurrected just after Jesus Christ, and they were seen walking the streets of Jerusalem, walking along the, the Red Sea. Come on, come on, right? Amen. And then it says in the scripture in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, at the last trump of God, at the last T-R-U-M-P, at the last trump of God. When was the first trump? The first trump was when all of Israel was at the base of Mount Sinai. And the scripture says that the, that the mountain waxed louder and louder like the voice of an archangel. And Moses took 70 elders and they went up. 70 elders stopped halfway up the mountain, and Moses continued to that place of the burning bush where it says, take thy sandals off, for this is holy ground. Amen? Amen. And there was the burning bush, and there the finger of God penned the Ten Commandments that Moses took and put in the Ark of the Covenant. He actually broke those, but he got another set. When man was raised up on the mountain, they received the word. Listen to this. That's the first trump. The second trump is when man is raised up again to receive not a tablet of stone, but the living word, Jesus. And when that, right at that moment before the, 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 the major mass uh, resurrection happens, the, the, you know, what's the word? Uh, the rapture. There's, that word's not in the Bible. But nor is Holy Trinity. And we know there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. But rapture is synonymous with resurrection. And so, so those, the, and it, it says, Jesus says in the parable, there'll be five foolish virgins and five wise virgins. To be a virgin is to be a believer, but one has full oil lamps, the other doesn't. And I want to talk to you today. What the Holy Spirit wants, to, wants you to know is it's not just faith in Jesus, but the God connection that you need. For Jesus is the door to the Father, and you need the Father connection, and many of you don't have that yet. You have faith for salvation, but you don't have faith for victory. Come on. And only, only a relationship with the Father through Jesus gives you the power and the authority, because where does the Father reside? He resides at the left hand of Jesus in his kingdom. And what are you inheriting when you have a relationship with the Father? The kingdom. The kingdom. You move to him. You understand what I'm saying? But you can't get to the kingdom without Jesus Christ. 
He is the door. There's no other way to a relationship with the Father. That's why the Lord's Prayer begins with our Father. Our Father. Our, y'all say our Father. Because He wants you to know that He is, not with an understanding of your mind, but with a revelation of your heart. And that's the one thing the enemy does not want you to have, is relationship with Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? So, right before the tribulation begins, there's going to be a resurrection of those that have full oil lamps. And as your pastor... What is my desire? That none of you should be left behind to endure the seven-year tribulation. Now, in the event you are, it's not the end of the world. But you're going to have to do those things that you should be doing now during that time. And I don't want you to go through that. You hear what I'm saying? The picture, the, Jesus says to the faithful church of Philadelphia, I will spare you the coming tribulation that the world has never seen. And which... Over a third of the waters and oceans will be like dead. Many of the trees will die off. There's going to be an environmental disaster, a political disaster. There's going to be, there's going to be scarcity on every level. Scarcity of energy, scarcity of water, scarcity of food, scarcity of everything. And scarcity is where Satan operates. Because when he can control what's left, then he can control the people. Understand what I'm saying? This scarcity is very important. When governments create scarcity, they're trying to control you. Understand what I'm saying? Come on. Yeah, you got to hear what you're saying. What's going on here? So, so you don't want to be around for that. You got no, Listen, don't try to earn the trophy for enduring the seven-year tribulation. Just bypass it and go straight to the marriage feast of the Lamb. Amen. One of my favorite foods, and I don't eat it very often because it's not the healthiest for you, is KFC. There's nothing like the original recipe, a big fat leg, and you just bite into it. I love it. But understand, at the marriage feast of the lamb, you can have all the KFC you want. It's not going to put a pound on you. All the mashed potatoes you want and dump the extra butter on it won't even matter. You hear what I'm saying? Y'all, it'll be a no-fat life, no heart disease life. Your body can take the calories like, well, yours could too, but well, you know what I'm saying. Amen? Like I even think of food right now. Wait a minute, I didn't even need it. I already got a pound on me. What's up with that? You hear what I'm saying? Wait till you get older. It's like you think of food. Like, what? All right, right? Some of you older people can say amen. Amen? Y'all are so... You got to say, amen, pastor. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So then the next trip, so you have the before the tribulationary period resurrection, because Jesus says it to the faithful church of Philadelphia, I will spare you the coming tribulation the world's never seen. He only says that to one of seven churches, one category. So what does that tell you about the other five categories of, quote, Christian churches? They don't have full oil lamps. They don't have the God connection. They have a Christ connection, but they haven't surrendered themselves to go through him to the Father. Are you hearing me, church? Not religion, not tradition, relationship all the way. First with Jesus, and through him, you have access to the very throne room of God. And he will hear all your petitions. What Satan doesn't want is for you to have a father relationship with God. He wants you to believe enough that Jesus will save you, yes. But understand, there's more to our faith than just him being a shut door to the Father. He is an open, open, open will you come in door. Open will you go through him door. Open will you go through him door. Open. And God will receive you as his son. But the only way he can is if you've dipped your robes in the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Come on. You don't do works to see the Father. You repent and humble yourself and enthrone Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you have full access. You have confidence. But, but Brother Raymond, I sinned last, yesterday. I said this and I did that. And I'm, oh. Well, the Father received me with the blood of the Lamb every time. 
<laughs> but if you forget the blood of the lamb, if you forget the blood of the lamb, if you forget the blood of the lamb, if you don't dip your robes, no father. Come on, come on. You need to have a father visitation every moment of your life, every day of your life, every day of your life. And when you know the father, he is your provider. No longer worry about what you will eat, what you shall drink, or what you shall wear. For the Gentiles eagerly search these things, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. Guess what most Christians are not doing? Seeking his kingdom and his righteousness. That wasn't a suggestion by Jesus. That was a command. And if he's truly your Lord, what should you be doing? Seek his kingdom and his righteousness. That is how you pass through Christ to the Father. Come on. Amen? Amen. And then... You have the two witnesses. And I know who it is. I for sure know it's Moses and Elijah. There's no doubt it's Elijah because he's still in his earthly body in heaven. And Moses, well, it says that the archangel had to come down and contend for the body of Moses after he died. He had to contend with Satan. Why did, why did the angel, archangel, have to contend for the body of Moses? Because he wasn't buried where people knew. He was hidden. They hid his body in the desert when they buried him. But the angel knew, Satan knew, and the angel had to stand before Satan and says, I want the body of Moses. Why? I want the body of Moses. I'm not going to give it to you. I want the body of Moses. Why? Because he will be one of the witnesses in the tribulation, mid-tribulation. What did Moses do? He turned the water to blood. Understand? There's a scarcity of water. Can you all say, Moses? as there was a scarcity in Egypt with one of the ten plagues. Come on. And then it's not going to rain. It's not going to rain. And the environmentalist movement is going to be high-pitched with the Antichrist. He's going to be the supreme environmentalist and the supreme healthcare person. Okay? And he's going to say, well, the waters have been soured by Moses, but the rains are going to come fresh. And Elijah's going to say, uh-uh, nope, it's going to stop the rains. Was Elijah still in his body? Yeah, he went up in a fiery chariot. That's what the scripture says. Elijah never died. He went straight up. Come on, he's still in his body. Now, to prove to you even further that Elijah and Moses are going to be with Jesus at mid-tribulation, when Jesus transfigured himself and James, John, and Peter were with him on the mountain of Trent, where he transfigured himself, who was Christ talking to? That's right, Elijah and Moses. And the apostles saw them like, oh, my God, Moses. If you're a baseball fan, it's like seeing Hank Aaron or Babe Ruth, some really awesome guy. You understand what I'm saying? Like, Moses, Moses, Moses. Elijah, come on, give it to me. That's how they were. And what do they want to do? They wanted to build three tabernacles to all three, Jesus, Elijah, and Moses. And Jesus is like, uh-uh, we're not doing that. No, we're not doing that. But what do you think that Jesus was discussing with Elijah and Moses about? Uh-huh, Moses, I got need for you. Mm-hmm. It's going to be during the marriage feast of the Lamb in heaven. I'm sorry you're not going to be a part of that, but you'll be down here in the tribulation. You say, Elijah too. Like, oh, really? Yeah, you're going to be there. It's been prophesied. You're going to be there because Israel will not receive me until you appear, Elijah, to them because that's the prophecy. You must appear to Israel before Israel will recognize Jesus as the Messiah. And when Elijah appears and Moses, because they thought Jesus would be like Moses parting the Red Sea and all this stuff. But Jesus, but Jesus was what? A humble, simple man. I don't even think he carried a staff. Come on, like Moses. I don't think do you all know that Jesus carried a staff like Moses did. I don't think so. I'm going to tell you what staff Moses is going to use. The same stuff he had before Israel, before Egypt. Come on. That staff is with him in heaven somewhere. I'm sure the angel said, mm, not just his body, but Satan, deliver a staff. Still got need for it. So was the body, ins- I don't know, I'm just saying. I'm sure Moses was like, I don't want to leave the earth without my staff. Can- where's my staff? Let's go. Come on. Y'all hear me? So he's up there with his staff, man, like ready. Come on. Walking tall, got this cane, you know what I'm saying? Ready to do business with the Antichrist. Now, what happens? Midway tribulation, oh, he is, so, he is so desperately tired of these two men. They're like thorns on his side. Guess what he does? <gasps> he kills them. And like William Wallace, 
They let his body be shown by everybody. Look, we killed him, and the whole world celebrates. Yeah, rain's coming. The blood will, the water will no longer be blood, and we can drink it again and bathe ourselves. It'll be awesome. These two men are gone. And after three days, a voice in heaven will say, Come up here. And Elijah and Moses before the world are going to resurrect themselves. And they're going to look at the Antichrist and go, you couldn't kill us. You couldn't kill us. But your days are numbered. You got three and a half more years. You got three and a half more. Get out of here. Go on. Go. You're making me look bad before all the people I've deceived. So, they'll, I mean, the Antichrist will be really happy he's gone. The false witness, oh, thank goodness, got resurrected. Now, he'll say, then Israel, like, oh, my gosh. Elijah and Moses, they said that Jesus is the Messiah. We heard it from their lips. They came. They fulfilled prophecy. And Israel is going to say, he truly was the king. And a great revival is going to break out in Jerusalem midway through the tribulation. You want to know the safest city in the whole world? It's not Austin. It's Jerusalem. God will protect Jerusalem. I don't know about Austin. Let's all move to Jerusalem. What do y'all think? No, we don't plan to be around for that. So we don't need to worry, right? We'll be raptured up. We'll be eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. Come on. Come on. Amen, right? Because we know Jerusalem's cool. It's cool. It's the most contested piece of land in the whole world, but it is the safest, according to God. Amen? Come on. And so, oh, my goodness. So what happens is a revival breaks out in Israel. And do you know there's another resurrection? 144,000 Jews, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel that became Christians born again. They're like, yes, let's worship in spirit and truth. Jesus has washed us. He was the Messiah that we crucified. And then there'll be a great rapture of 144,000 perfected Jews now to populate heaven. Come on. And then the mark will start getting stamped on people's foreheads. Like a rubber stamp. In fact, it says in the scripture that God, before the 144,000 came up, he put a seal on their foreheads also. Because Satan's mocking what he did to the 144,000. Oh, I see. So God, you're going to put, a, you're going to put your seal on 144,000 before you take them up? Well, I'm going to give a false seal. One that kind of looks like it, but isn't. You ever heard of that before? Deception? Let me tell you where this new, the mark of the beast will come from. It'll have Nephilim origins. And it will promise you, if you take this like the wonder COVID vaccine, if you, oh, there we go. We're going to be cut off YouTube now. Oh, well, it doesn't matter. So, so what's going to happen, because we've been cut off before. I talk about COVID. That is an evil thing. Don't take it. It's a precursor to the coming thing. They're putting fear on you. Don't even take that juice because it's messing with your DNA. Never, ever take a DNA, mRNA altering drug because that's where the future mark is coming to. And when someone takes the mark, you'll never have cancer. You'll always be healthy. And our welfare system that's going broke will now be stabilized because, mm, and then you can't buy, sell, and trade because healthcare is so important. Kind of like what, you know, they did in Canada, like, you can't drive a truck. You can't work a job unless you take this evil, awful vaccine. See how it's all kind of working out here? See how they're kind of training people? <gasps> if you don't take it, you're going to die. You're going to die. Oh, fear, 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 fear. All they fear mongering. That's all they did is the spirit of fear. It's one of the most powerful demonic forces on this earth is fear. And so many people are ruled by fear. Fear was the instrument that controlled the world. Do you know many restaurants today are not open late anymore because of that COVID whole issue? They cut their menus in half. Man, COVID had far-reaching holds on people and on businesses. So, so here's, the, here's the thing. If someone takes that mark, it changes their DNA. And they're no longer of the DNA that goes to Adam and Eve. They have the DNA of an Amorite, a Canaanite, a Hittite. And Jesus didn't die for them. 
He died for those that had perfect genealogy. When he spared Noah and his family, the scripture says in Genesis chapter 6 that Noah was a righteous man, perfect in his genealogy. Amen? Perfect in his genealogy. I want you to hear something. Hear me. I'll repeat these words. I am perfect in my genealogy to Adam and Eve. Amen. And you're going to remain that way. No mark. You hear me? But do we need to worry about that in this room? Some of you are like, it's either, yes, Pastor Raymond, we don't need to worry about that, or I'm not sure. Which is it? With a round, are you filled in the Holy Spirit? Are your oil lamps half full or, or full? Who decides whether they're half full or full? You do. By stirring up and enthroning the Holy Spirit in you. You have to enthrone the Spirit in you. You have to enthrone the Holy Spirit in you. That means you quit worrying, quit doubting, quit trying to rationalize. The Holy Spirit's got it. You say, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit has, got me. has got me. He'll work everything out. Work everything out. By, trusting in God, By trusting in God through his spirit and not my senses, not my senses. It, will always work out. it will always work out. But the minute, the minute. I, put I put my self-will, my, self-will. my pride and ego, my pride. and I got this rolled up my sleeve mentality, I, got this up my sleeve mentality. I have half full in my oil. That's right. Because you just dumped it for yourself. Come on. Are you hearing me? And I don't want you to be that way. I don't want you to be that way. And then the tribulation's going on, and then Jesus mounts the white horse, and the armies dressed in white linen come down, and they land on what I call the launching pad, the spaceport, the the port of heaven, the, the Mount of Olives. Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives. Guess where he's going to descend to? That's right, the Mount of Olives. And all those in white linens will be, the armies of the living God will be with them on horses. Come on. Okay. Do y'all like horses? Have y'all ever ridden a horse? Oh, right. And do you know in heaven, there's a stable? There are many stables. And do you know there's a stable with your white gown? And there's a horse waiting for you to ride behind Jesus? You didn't know it, that being a follower of Jesus makes you a cowboy and a cowgirl. (laughs) But not, let me, let me rewrite that. Let me say that being a follower of Jesus makes you a knight on a horse, part of the army of God. Y'all ever see Narnia? Isn't that a great movie? You know how they get on the horses and... And he's on that horse called Philip. I mean, I'll never forget that. My name is Philip. Okay. I want you all to see that. When you're coming down, be like Narnia. You'll be arrayed in armor, in a beautiful horse. And you're going to see Jesus with the word written on his thigh. And the glory of God. And you're going to see all the, it says, the scripture says that all, when Jesus returns to to uh, the Mount of Olives, he says, all the world will mourn the return of Christ. If the whole world mourns the return of Christ, do you think there's any Christians left on the world? Not one. Not one. Not one will be left on the world. And you'll be the first to see all those armies that God made, all the evil armies trying to kill Jesus and going to have it. He says he'll destroy them by the brightness of his glory. And by the sword of his mouth. All the evil in this world will be annihilated before your eyes. And then his horse lands, your horse lands. And he says in Matthew 24, I will gather them from the east and the west and the north and the south. And I will bring all Israel. That's the horizontal rapture. All Israel 
all every Jew that died in the Holocaust, every Jew is going to, of all the 12 tribes, are going to stand at the base of the Mount of Olives. And who are they going to see? Jesus, the Messiah. And the prophet Zechariah said, and they shall gaze on them whom they pierced. And Jesus is going to show the piercings. And you know, the, the Pharisees that sit there when Jesus was dying on the cross, and they said, if you're the son of God, come off that cross. No, well, he didn't because he wasn't supposed to. But he did something better. He was raised from the dead. And they're going to remember that. And I can't wait. Listen, do you want to stand with me? I know you do. You're smiling. He says, yes, I want to stand with you. I want to see the look on that guy's face that says, come off that cross. <coughs> How about you? Do you want to see the look on that Jewish like? You were the Messiah, and we crucified you. Forgive me. You're going to see all these self-glorified men that crucified Christ fall on their knees, throw down their crowns, and worship him. You hear what I'm saying? Wouldn't it be worth a front row ticket to see that? As you pay your horse, he goes, like that. Come on. You hear that? He's kind of standing there, moving his, like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm acting like a horse. Play with me. Go with me. You understand what I'm saying? Come on, that is so cool, isn't it? And then the millennial reign starts for a thousand years. Come on, are y'all hearing me? So how many raptures are there? A lot more than one. A lot more than one. There's Jesus, the 500 holy men of Israel. There's the rapture before the tribulation. There's the rapture of the two witnesses. There's the rapture of the 144,000. And there's the rapture of those that finish the tribulation. Happens to be the number of man, six. Isn't that awesome? Many raptures. Many resurrections. Come on. Y'all excited? So which one do you want to be a part of? KFC one. Are y'all good? Do you understand the victory God's given you through Christ our Lord? The great victory that you have over sin and death, over every evil thing. When we partake of communion, when we partake of the communion. Yeah, you can come up here. Yeah. What is your name, sir? Bond James. <laughs> you look so handsome and great. So sad. You look great. And uh, do you mind blessing, consecrating communion? Thank you. We will, sorry. So we will now uh, take our bread, hold up, and we consecrate this bread in remembrance of Jesus Christ who sacrificed himself to uh, die for our sins and cleanse us, uh, cleanse us. And he, this bread, we break it in remembrance of, uh, of what he did. It was the ultimate sacrifice of his flesh to bring us to glory and perfection in the name of God. So now take our communion. And we take this grape juice and we consecrate this grape juice in remembrance of the blood that washes away our sins. Just like the body that was broken, this was the blood that poured out and this blood cleansed us in every single way and made us perfect in the eyes of God and forgave all of our sins. It bathed us completely. This is the blood of the Lamb. Amen. The Lord says, I just hear his voice. He says the, the foundation of revival is with the church. The foundation of revival is with the church. The foundation of revival is with the church. God bless you, sir. I'll see you later. The foundation of revival 
is with the church. The foundation of revival is with the church. We're here for, I want you to understand if you, why we're here. To swing wide open the gate of heaven so that all can come in and experience the presence and fullness of Jesus Christ. But it won't happen out of ignorance. It won't happen because we're following religion and tradition. It will happen because we surrender and take up our crosses and follow Jesus. That's why it will happen. We don't follow a doctrine. We follow Christ. Are you hearing me? And I don't think there's many Christ followers in churches. I think there's people that follow those in churches, but I don't think they're following Jesus. Are you hearing me? Because where the Spirit is, there is liberty. Amen? Liberty from the law. Some of the most, and this is something that the Holy Spirit told me, as you sanctify and consecrate yourself in following Jesus, in other words, that the old wineskins in you die off, that the new wineskins would be come in. And I was talking to Michelle about this yesterday. We were talking about this. It is so easy as you follow Jesus to become legalistic about it. And the minute you allow legalism to step in to the realm, to the arena of being a follower of Jesus, you no longer follow him, even if you think you are. It's real important that none of us fall into the state of deception that by keeping up with laws and traditions, we somehow believe that that is the same as forsaking those laws and traditions to be a follower of Jesus. Because law and tradition doesn't require the love of God. It just requires an ideological obedience to a, to a governance, to this, this authority of, of legalism. I want you to hear what Holy Spirit's saying. But when you are a follower of Jesus and the kingdom begins to manifest in your life, it is the love of the Father that transforms you so that you become the living word. As Christ is the living word, you, the word that is in you, begins to overpower all of your senses. And now the fulfillment of the law is in you through Christ the Lord. So as he crucified the law, legalism. The Spirit came down, the Holy Spirit came down, that as followers of Christ, as we obey Him and follow His voice, that we are no longer establishing an illegal, a legal standard and code for our faith. The only way I can define the code of Christ and God is by the purity of His love. Because nothing, nothing is going to transform you but the love of God. And if you don't have that love in you, in the depth of every part of your heart, even the broken parts, you'll never be whole. And as long as you remain whole, broken, like because of rejection of your past, because of abuse and stuff like that, evil things that have happened that you've witnessed that have hurt you, those are, those are satanic soul ties to Satan. Every broken piece in you is. Luke 11, verse 36, Jesus says, Therefore, if the whole eye is full of light, having no part dark, just like the light of day. So the soul can be fragmented between light and dark. And I've got to tell you something. If you don't become whole, you will live in the bondage of darkness. You may have salvation, but you're not going to have kingdom. That's why Jesus proclaimed in, when he was in Nazareth, for I've come to heal the brokenhearted and set free the captives in that order. And today the scripture's fulfilled. What, and the reason why people are demonized, the reason why the enemy can operate through people is because of a broken heart. You heal the broken heart, close the doors of brokenness, and Satan no longer has legal authority and right to remain in that person to persecute them. Addiction goes. The spirit of death goes. The spirit of insanity goes. All these evil things go. And the blessings and promises of God start pouring into you. But first, you've got to be made whole. And that's the first of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for those are the kingdom of God. 
The kingdom is power, authority, and provision. Power, authority, provision. Power, authority, provision. And when we come to see, I can't take you and like put a handcuff on you, take you before Jesus and say, be whole in the name of Jesus. I can't do that. I can't. If you don't become whole, you're going to die. You're going to go through the tribulation. You sinner. That's legalism. We must be rooted and grounded in the love of God. And what's legal about his love? How do we make a law out of love? You can't. So don't try to replace love of God with law. Don't do it. Because in doing that, you deny who Christ did, who he is and what he did. The, the full example of love is Jesus. He is not only the word that became flesh, but the love of God that became flesh too. In fact, why don't we, what do you know? The word and love are one and the same. Not the one that we define, but the one that God is. And you, many of you don't know that love yet. You know love, but you don't know the love of God. That's why you still have in your heart this attitude of rejection and unworthiness. Come on, you're not worthy. Unworthiness begins in children. That's where your unworthiness started when you were a child. And even though you went to church, you never felt that God truly loved you. And you grew up feeling that and believing that and sensing that. And you didn't open your heart to, to have him heal your broken heart. Do you know that brokenness follows brokenness? Broken people attract broken people. If you're broken and you get married, you're married a broken person. And that broken person that you marry is a Pandora's box of evil that you don't know. And there's an, e there's an entanglement between your brokenness and their brokenness in most marriages and in divorce. I'm just telling you now. They will end in divorce every time if the brokenness is not dealt with, unless they become highly legalistic Christians like some of our grandparents were highly legalistic. And you're like, if being married 50 years means that you kind of live with a board between your side of the bed and their side of the bed, and you're more like, it's more like a civil union for the sake of it, just to, just to impress people and because it, it's better for your taxes and because you don't have enough retirement to split apart, so you need to stay together kind of mentality. Y'all can see those kind of relationships. That is not marriage. That's garbage. And that's what a broken heart can... Just because a person's married 50 years does not mean they have a healthy marriage at all. Don't be caught up with years. Come on. You hearing me? You got to be made whole. And pride is the barrier to it. Pride and ignorance. I'm here to open the door of God's kingdoms that you can enter through. Because I was one of the most brokenhearted people in this room. I was an intolerable person. See, I didn't need people to hate me. I hated me enough. In fact, all, I, all my self-hate was more than anybody could give me. Just because someone didn't like me, I didn't care because I didn't like myself. You can't hurt me because I don't like me. You can't hurt me because I hate myself. I don't have any hope for the future because I don't believe that a good future can come to me. It's just going to be misery, a life of misery, a life of getting by, of working hard and not having much. That's not the promise of God. You need to understand you will attract in your heart what you are. No matter how hard you try, you will not likely attract a whole person if you're brokenhearted because a whole person will see the demons in you and they don't they carry a cloud around them. I don't want to be about that. And they'll see in you a pride that resists the glory of the spirit that lives in you. And they don't want to, be, they don't want to yoke up with you. Why? Because they were once like you, and they don't want to go back to that. But they try to tell you, but you're broken. No, I'm not. I'm fine. What are you talking about? Shut up. You can't judge me. Well, if they've already taken the log out of their own eye, they can. You understand what I'm saying? Please hear what, I'm, what we're saying here. There are many in this room that need deliverance or are moving forward for deliverance. But I'm going to tell you, it's not going to fully happen until you open your heart and you allow Jesus 
in the, in, that you humble yourself. You need to humble yourself. Do you know the secret to deliverance is the understanding that you and the Holy Spirit are always a super majority when it comes to your mind, body, and soul, and spirit? You have the one. The Holy Spirit created the world through Christ. All things were created through Christ, for Christ, in Christ. All creation is the manifestation of Christ. You're created fearfully in Christ. Amen? You are created fearfully. But does your soul know that? Does all your soul know that? No, it does not. Listen, I'm talking to you young people in this room under the age of, yes, he says, yeah, I'm young. You know, as you get older, it'll, you'll always tell people, it's not the age, man, it's the mileage. Right? Imagine a 1969 Ford Bronco with a six-inch lift, mud tires, no rust on it, with 20,000 miles. Or a 2023 with 150,000 miles. One's a one-year-old and the other one's like, which one would you drive? Yeah, amen. Amen. He gets it too. You see? So I'm trying to make a point to you. You need to walk whole. God promises you, and I want to talk to the young people. These two girls that look like twins, they're so cute. And her brother, and you young man, handsome strapping man back there. Yeah, I'm talking to, uh-huh. I'm talking to you. And you, little man. Well, you're kind of older now. But you're still in the arena, so are you. Okay. Listen to me. You too. You're worthy of all of God's promises. And you don't have to hide and cover up shame and guilt because things aren't perfect or haven't been perfect in your life. You understand what I'm saying? The blood, plead the blood of Jesus over all your sin. And when he covers you and washes you in your blood, you don't have to live with shame, guilt, and condemnation anymore. And you don't have to try to sweep it under the, under the carpet. You understand what I'm saying? You can live confidently. You understand that, young man? What's your name? Say it out loud. Aiden? Aiden. You're the head and not the tail. Blessed. I want all you young children. I want all of y'all. Just raise your hand. I'm going to raise mine. Can we all agree right now? Blessed shall be the work of your hands. Blessed shall be every place that your feet touch. Blessed is the Lamb of God whose blood has taken away my sins. I will no longer live in fear. I will never live in an unworthy manner because my Father loves me in heaven. I can go before my Father in heaven because of what Jesus did for me. He made me a new creation. He washed me in his blood. He lives in me. His spirit lives in me. And my father lives in me. I ask you, spirit, to consume me with fire, with the love of God. Shower me with your presence every part of my soul, it cries out to you. You are my provider. You are my protector. You are my hope. You're my everything. I will seek your kingdom and your righteousness, and I will serve you as your son all the days of my life. I shall be blessed. I shall not be the tell. I'll be the head. I'm not going to be the borrower. I'm going to be the lender. Because your word says that, God. And your word lives in me. And I adopt your word. 
It's my standard. Not a law. Not legalism. Not read the Bible to adjust my behavior. But that my soul, the hurt, the sorrow would be quenched by the fire of your love for me. For Jesus, you died for me. You thought of me when you gave your life for me. And I will be your follower. I won't follow religion. I won't become a legalist. I'm not going to follow tradition. I want to be your disciple, your follower, Jesus. Open my eyes that I may see the things that natural eyes cannot see, the things of the Spirit. And open my ears that I not only hear the things of this world, but I hear your voice, that you lead me. Because your word says that you are the great shepherd and your sheep hear your voice and they follow you and you know them. Well, I know you know me for I hear your voice now, the voice of your spirit. I will fear nothing. I will walk in faith. I won't be legalist anymore. I know I'm a sinner. I want to, I sin today. I will sin tomorrow. And forgive me. But every time, every day, I will plead your blood. I will wash my robes daily in your blood. And I will enthrone your spirit in my heart always. And I know Satan. He wants me to have half an oil lamp. He's going to try to push it over. And that's going to make me mad. It's going to make me really mad, but I'm going to forgive that the Holy Spirit will refill my lamp when I raise it up to him. And I will raise that up to him every day for my home, wherever I go, will always remain as a bridal chamber of Jesus Christ. I am his bride. I am his son. And I'm an heir to every promise that God has spoken over me. He will give me the desires of my heart. Because I will follow him in spirit and truth. And I will walk boldly as a child of God, filled in the Holy Spirit, walking, following my Messiah, my Jesus. I am his disciple. Yeah, I can call myself a Christian. And many do who don't follow. But I call myself a disciple of Jesus Christ, my Lord, Savior, and King. Amen. Woo, I'm feeling that, man. Woo, the Holy Spirit was just all over me on that. It's so beautiful. Y'all receive that? And that's how foundation, the foundation of this church is based on that. We're all followers of Christ because we choose to be. And the church is built on that. Amen? Amen. And no weapon forged against you will ever prosper. And you will be made whole by his love. That's how. And you're going to walk in boldness and confidence, no longer with shame, guilt, and condemnation. I want every one of you to picture your future. I want everyone to put your dreams, your goals, your desires, and you have them. I know you do. I want you to see this next year. Young people, I want you to see this next year, this year. In your heart, you have desires. You have things that you really want to see happen, don't you? Don't y'all? Don't you? Yes, they all say yes. All of us have something Understand the impossible is possible with God. But you cannot understand how God can do for you. Amen? And have that faith. Have that faith. Have the faith for the impossible. Amen? And don't worry about it. Trust Him, and He will work it out. Say, my God will work it out. He'll work it out. Amen.
It may seem crazy what you want. But God can do it. God can restore you and your boyfriend to be living pillars transformed completely in Christ. And I believe not only will he set you free, he'll set him free, and you will both be whole and yoked together. If that's what you put on your heart, God can do it. There's hope in Christ. Amen? There's hope in him. But do those things that he calls for you to do and follow him and be his disciple and watch the hand of God do the impossible. Amen? Because he'll give you the desires of your heart. He'll give you that future camping trip where you're worshiping around a fire and the presence of God's angels are there in a beautiful place. He'll show you. Because I know your heart, says the Lord. I know your wants. You follow him. And in this church, you'll learn to. Amen? Come on. Y'all good? Yay, man. I am so happy y'all were here. Levi, did y'all have anything to share? You good? Yeah, Bryn, come up here with him. You're here until when do you go when do you go back west? In 2 weeks. Come up here. Amen, amen. Yes. Come on, little man. This is my little man right here. Little man. Uncle Raymond. Uncle Raymond. Tiny Tim. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just talking to him yesterday. Um, yeah, so we're going to be up in Seattle in two more weeks. And for y'all who don't know, I play for the Seattle Seahawks with my wife, Bren. Uh, but yeah, so I just wanted to share... And he felt like I led that I should. But I've been really on this journey of the Lord healing my broken heart. Um, I love the Lord with all my heart, but there's a lot of brokenness there. And it's like the sermon was calling me out because I filled it with a lot of legalism. A lot of, Jesus, I love you, Lord, like praying. You know, I feel like I'm pressing in, but... It's not as genuine because there's a lot of brokenness there from my past. And um, so I've been trying to go on this journey. Like, I got to get this healed. I got to get this how I just, like, feel like I have to do it. I have to do it. And the Holy Spirit had some breakthrough in me yesterday. Um, and he was like, you can't do anything. And you're not going to be the one that does it. I'm going to do it. And he gave me like a humbling moment where I, I realized I can't do anything. He can do it. I just got to keep coming to him, listening to his voice. And I want to encourage all y'all, whatever you're going through in your life, get out of the driver's seat. Stop putting the burdens of life on yourself. The How am I going to pay the bills or... How am I going to accomplish what I want to accomplish? Or how am I going to get this breakthrough that I want to get this breakthrough I'm so desperate for? And say, Holy Spirit, whatever you tell me to do, I'll do. Even when it's hard. Like, my knee got injured last year. And I'm training, and it, inj it hurts every once in a while. And you can get cut if your knee is injured. And I'm like, Lord, why is it not getting healed? I'm like, breakthrough, come on, breakthrough. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and was like, I'm leaving it there so you can trust me. And I want to encourage y'all, the things that you go through in life, it's not always there. It's not always just meant to be immediately gone. God allows you to go through things because he cares about your character. He doesn't care as much about your comfortability because he knows that if he gives you comfortability, you're going to be a spoiled little child. But and he knows if he can allow you to go through things, your character is going to be developed, and then you're going to be way more 
ahead and prepared for the mission he has for you. So I want to encourage every one of y'all to sit down and just ask him a question. Because every one of y'all can hear God's voice, whether you realize it or not. I know the world's always like, be distracted, be distracted, be distracted. But if you have the Lord, it says, my sheep know my voice. Y'all can hear his voice. Ask him a question. Sit there, quiet your mind. You have to go in the, the quietness of your mind. It's called the secret place. Still your mind and listen, and he'll speak to you. And then he'll show you the steps you need to take. And that's why he's always like, I can't get you there. No matter what I tell you, I can't get you there. And you can't get you there. He can. That's the God connection. It's your own one-on-one personal relationship that only you individually can have. Only, it, like, no one else can describe how personal it is. The only, like, only you and him have that. And all y'all little kids, y'all can have that too. And I'm, I can see it on you that you have that hunger. You can be talking to God right now. He cares about all the little details. Every little detail of your life, he cares about every bit. So ask him. Sit there. And let him teach you his voice, and then you'll start going down the path he has for you. And then you're unstoppable with him. But you have to be able to humble yourself. If you think, I'm going to figure it out, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm fine. Like, no, that's the pride part. You have to be like, I need the Lord, I need him to lead me. And he speaks to those who have that humble, humble mindset and hunger. But yeah, I just want to encourage all y'all. The Lord's doing breakthrough. I am jacked up in my heart. Like, the Lord, like I have a lot of brokenness that comes up because uh, of my childhood, but the Lord is doing a lot of work, and I just want to encourage you all. That is the step, is listening to the Holy Spirit. He's the only person who can piece you all together, and he's the only person who's going to hold you, and he will always come through if you trust him. But, yeah, God bless you all. He'll always come through for you. Always come through for you. When you walk with Christ, don't turn it into a law book of doing so. Surrender. The only law is the law of surrender. The more you give up, the more you gain. The more you trust, the quicker you grow. Amen? Every one of you in this room is facing a challenge that you don't know how you're going to get through. You're facing an unknown that you don't know what to do about. It's emotional. It's mental. It's physical. And it's tough. You're being ground like powder under a rock. And it hurts. Christ sees that. He hurt for you so that you would not hurt. You put your hurt on him. You put your cares on him. Come into a relationship with Jesus where you put all your faith and trust in him, especially those things that affect you emotionally. I want to say this to you because this is what the Holy Spirit's saying. Many of you, you trust him, but not on an emotional level. You don't trust God on an emotional level. And this is what I'm talking about, called the God connection. You have a Jesus faith connection, enough for salvation. But you don't have the God connection where you can dump out all your emotional baggage into the loving arms of a Father in heaven who wants to care for you. This is the kind of relationship that Jesus came to give you. And I, I can tell you, this church, this mission, doesn't forge that in ourselves. And what are we doing? Why are we here? Why are we here? If it's not to have that emotional connection with a loving Father. Jesus says in Matthew 23, call no one Father in heaven on earth, for you have one Father in heaven. I don't care that my son says, Dad, you mind if I call my God Father and not you? 
Amen. You compliment me when you know God, my Father, as your Father. And I'm not offended by that. If my, one of my four daughters were to come to me and say, Dad, I'm just not going to call you Father. I just want to just love and serve my Father in heaven. No offense. No offense. You understand what I'm saying? He is the father to the fatherless and the husband to the widow. Come on. He is my dad. Amen. And if, and if you're married and, or divorced or whatever or in a relationship that's toxic, been, been there for a long time, you can be married and still have Christ, your, God as your husband. You can. If my wife said, honey, God is my husband. I'm not going to say I'm getting a divorce. I want to say amen. Because he's imperishable. He's incorruptible. And he's immortal. Amen? So it doesn't hurt me for her to say, God is my husband. And I'll pray, Michelle, that he is more than me. And in that, we'll have an awesome marriage. And guess what? God is my husband also. If I can be the bride of Jesus, then I can be the husband of God. Or he can be my husband. Amen? Because in the kingdom, there's no male or female. There's only one in Christ. Amen? Amen. Come on. Are y'all good? Y'all feeling that? So I just release the anointing and presence of God over your hearts, over your lives. I pray that hearts begin to get healed. Not because of my voice, but because of the presence of the Father that's here. That you will open your hearts and receive the healing love of God. It doesn't matter how much you were victimized in your past. It doesn't matter who did you wrong. And I just want you right now to forgive everyone that's ever hurt you. Forgive yourself for what you didn't do or should have done or what you did do that you shouldn't have done. Forgive yourself. Forgive everyone who's ever hurt you, who's ever... Just forgive. Forgive God. Many of you, you're you're holding a grudge against God. Like, why did God, did you take this person away from me? Why did you do this to me? He didn't. Satan did. Just... Acknowledge God and just in your heart with absolute abandonment, give up all that weight and surrender all the heaviness to God. All the heaviness, all the heaviness in your heart, all the sorrows, all the guilt, all the condemnation, all the shame. Surrender it. Surrender it. It doesn't matter what your past, which is more powerful, the memory of a past or the blood of the lamb. The blood. Amen. Someone said the blood. Amen. The blood. So plead the blood and don't look back anymore. Do not look back. Do not look back in your past if you've covered it in the blood and go forward and trust the Father. Surrender everything unto Him. And if you've opened your heart, to all of your heart, to the love of God and asked Jesus to heal your broken heart by surrendering and forgiving all those that have trespassed against you, then in the name of Jesus, I declare you whole. And in the name of Jesus, we renounce the power of darkness over your soul. We renounce evil. We renounce the spirit of witchcraft. We renounce all evil, the Jezebel spirit, all power and principality. We bind and we loose off the, off the children of the Lord now in Jesus' name. All mind control, all addiction, The spirit of heaviness, we command you to go in the name of Jesus. All unclean portals, all soul ties be broken now in the name of Jesus. I just invite you right now, Holy Spirit says, break every soul tie. I say, I break every soul tie. I I break the, the curses of generations from my father and mother. I break it. No curse. Ancestral will attach itself to me. 
I set myself free from the bondage of sins of my fathers, especially in the era of witchcraft, Freemasonry. I surrender all the occult. Forgive me forever being involved in the occult. I draw the bloodline of Jesus over every power of evil that was generated against me because of the occult. Forgive me for having spilt blood in any way. I proclaim myself free from the bondage of that sin. I shall no longer walk in under the shadow of unworthiness. But I ask you, Lord, let your light shine upon me. I shall not be the tell. I shall be the head. I curse, bind, and loose the power of poverty and financial insufficiency over my life, over my household. We shall be blessed according to the word of the Lord. He spoke these words, that God's promises would overtake me, that I would be the lender and not the borrower. I command all generational infirmity, arthritis, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, mental disease, any form of physical disease, the spirit of cancer, generational cancer, I bind them now and I loose them. They will no longer have fruit in my life. Like the fig tree that did not bear fruit, when Jesus looked for it, for the fruit, the scripture says that Jesus cursed the tree and it dried at the root. And so do I now, according to the word of the Lord, could he said, those that follow him would do the same works. I now curse every unfruitful form of evil in me, every unfruitful tree planted there by darkness. I curse it at its root. It will no longer bear unrighteous and ungodless fruit in my life. But I ask you, Father, to plant your word in my heart that I may bear all the fruit. For your word says, I cannot do anything without you. I can do nothing without you. You are my strength, my resource, and my power. And in you, I shall trust, not in my senses, not in my abilities, not in the strength, but in your spirit. I resign everything to trust you and follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. I think there's some breakthroughs. Amen. Y'all, y'all good? Every day, you must renounce the power of darkness. Before the sun sets today, the world is going to try to cast another spell on you. Of poverty. Of unworthiness. He's going to put drop that seed in your mind. You have got to reject it. Every day, you are in a spiritual battle for victory, and you've got to tame your will to take authority over darkness that has a will that opposes the promises of God in your life. You need to be militant about taking the Holy Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the blessed prayer of righteousness the belt of truth, and your feet shod with the gospel of peace. Take your authority. Take your authority. Because just because we prayed this prayer once doesn't mean you can't come. You're going to have to come back tonight to get it. Not here, but in your prayer life.
You understand what I'm saying? Because the enemy is like a wave of the ocean. He keeps coming. He keeps coming. He keeps coming. And you need to be like a wave of faith going back and pushing back against those waves. You understand what I'm saying? Prayer is like a sea. It's like a sea. It's waves that keep hitting the seashore. Let your prayer counter the world every day. Every day you're in a spiritual battle. Every day you're pleading the blood because you fall short. Listen, if you fall short, it's okay if you fall back. If you do something silly that causes sin, if you cave in for a moment to darkness or even for a little while, what do you do? Step out. Wash yourself in the blood. And I want you to practice this. I'm teaching you spiritual warfare 101. Here you do it. You ready? Mm -hmm. Psalm 51, 7 through 17. You ask the Holy Spirit to purge you. I want you to ask right now, Holy Spirit, purge me. me. Now do it. From head to toe, let the Holy Spirit purge you. Drive out and say in your heart, drive out the darkness. Drive out the the fear. Drive out the the sickness. Drive Drive out the curses. Come on, let the Holy Spirit purge you, purge you. Say, purge me, Holy Spirit, from head to toe. Wash yourself in the blood. Repent. Are you hearing me? Ask the Holy Spirit to rise up in you, living waters, living fire. Say, rise up in me, Holy Spirit, your fire, your peace. Amen. Did y'all feel that? How often do you need to do that? Every day, many times a day. Are you hearing me? And when you do that, the resource of heaven surrounds you. And now you can take down those powers. Amen? Amen. Can you do that? Yes. How many of y'all have never done that before until you, till now? This is what you need to do every day. When darkness is consuming you, when you're like, you're just in this vice. me. Rise up in me. Forgive me for doubting your word. Forgive me. I humble myself before you, Father. I ask for your love, mercy, and grace to set me free out of this captivity. beautiful. I feel it every time. I feel it every time. And just when I thought I felt it the moment before, I feel it again on me even more powerfully. But how can you do this? How can you live every day without doing this? Stoke the fire of the Holy Spirit in your life because the devil will never quit trying to put it out. You have got to do something about what the devil's doing. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But you have the power of the cross as a follower of Christ to overcome this world the way Jesus did. Amen. I close with that. God bless you. God keep you. Considering supporting our church. And for those that you have, thank you. Father, we just bless the tithes and the offerings that have come in through the Tithely app. Don't feel pressured. You do what the Holy Spirit calls you to do. I don't keep accounts. No one does. If you're led to do whatever, do it, but don't worry if you, if you can't. Don't even worry about it. We're not about monetizing the Bible. So we thank you, Father, for all the provision, all the supply. Bless it back 30, 60, and fold, and rebuke the devourer from the fruits. May the Lord God be with you, keep you, and preserve you. May his love shine over you, and may his hedge be around you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. We'll